Hello and welcome to another special program we have today. We have a very special guest. The guy's name is Jerry McKenzie. I don't know if you musicians out there have heard of Jerry before, but he's a rather famous individual, at least in his own mind. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And Jerry, Jerry is, uh, has a ton of experience. He's worked around the Detroit area for years, but he is even, even more famous than that. He's, uh, he's worked with the state famous, one of my favorite bands, the Stan Kenton Band. So Jerry, where the heck did you get interested in music? Well, first, let me say how nice it is to be here with you and share these uh, uh, stories that, because people like to hear a lot of the stories right. behind the scenes. I, 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 my mother took me to the Fox Theater many, many years ago. I was three years old, and I was fortunate enough to see Norman Grand's Jazz at the Philharmonic. And of course, at that time, Gene Krupa was with uh, Norman Grand's uh, Louis Belson was with Norman Granz, and Buddy Rich was with Louis. Whoa, three of the best drummers yeah. in the business. And also, that's where I got a great chance to hear a marvelous, marvelous trio was Oscar Peterson with Ray Brown, and the drummer was Ed, Ed Thigpen. And at that time, I became engrossed in watching Gene, and to make a real long story short, I told my mother, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to play the drums. And how old were you at this point? I was three years old. Oh, jeez, that's great. And fortunately, to speed it up, the story, at age six, my mother was fortunate enough to find a drum teacher at age six. So I wow. started at age six, George. Wow. So, and I assume you learned how to read music and you, you played with, did you play with high school bands or anything like that? Yes, yes. I was the uh, captain of the marching band. We had uh, eight snare drummers and I was the one who blew all the whistles and all the commands for the band to start down the field, back up the field, and right. off the field and all that, yes. Were these guys that, that went out front and, and did the, the back bends that go way, all the way back, you know, and come back up? Uh, you, you were no, we, we did not do that at that time, George. You didn't no. do that, huh? No. Well, tell me about, you know, where you started actually playing with big bands, because that's where you're kind of a famous guy. I, my, my first big band was actually, believe it or not, was, uh, the Glenn Miller Band, okay, under really? the direction of Ray McKinley. Okay? You played with that band? Yes, I went, and I also did uh, some uh, musical things with Tex Beneke, who led the band right. at that time. Oh, yeah. Tex Beneke. Ray was, uh, I was on the band when Ray McKinley was with the band. Okay. And Ray and I shared the drum chair. So I was m mainly known as the, uh, the ballad drummer. And, and how old were you at this point? I was uh, 20. 20 years old, wow. Uh, yes. What a yes. great experience. Actually, just shy of 20, okay? And I, I was on the band uh, at that particular time with Ray. And at that time, so many bands were touring, George. They were all touring. We used to bump into other bands and Stan Kenton. We would be checking in the hotel. Right. Stan's band would be checking out. So. I got to know Stan, okay, just, you know, hello, how are you, nice to see you again yeah. in, that, in that particular situation, okay. But before you got to the point where you were playing with the Ray McKinley Band and some of those other bands, you must have, you must have done some stuff in high school. And yes, I was fortunate enough to play with a big band in, in high school. It was just a, a like a, a lab band, okay. Uh, okay, at that time. And also I worked with a small group that had, it was called the Sammy D Quintet. Okay. We were on a TV show every Saturday similar to uh, Dick Clark's Bandstand. So I got a lot of exposure with that group. It was two tenor saxophones, piano, guitar, and drums. Fantastic. And it was, the saxophone players used to have what was called the Battle of the Saxes. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The one, person would lay on the floor and the other sax player would blow down to him on the floor with the saxophone and push his way all around the dance floor. You know, I hate to say this, Jerry, but I used to do that too. 
Really? Back in my younger days. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, my goodness. You lay on your back, kick your feet up in the air, and play the saxophone. It's great fun. Right. <laughs> and, and plus, it was, it was, we did a lot of rock and roll, so I was exposed yeah. to the rock and roll style of drumming. Which is a lot time. different. Yes. Especially that, with the foot. Yes. Right? At that time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's, gr that's great. So anyway, you, you, you're 20 years old, and now you get an opportunity to go out and play with these huge big bands you know, that are traveling around the country. You must, have, you must have spent a lot of time on the road. Yes, I did. I spent a lot of time with the Miller Band, and what transpired was we, the Miller Band, were in Vegas, okay, and we were playing at the Riviera Hotel and Kenton's band was at the Tropicana Hotel. And I got to a point of where I wanted to play a little bit more. Sure. Some of the specialty tunes on the Miller Band. And I finally thought it was, it was my, me and the guitar player talked about it. And, and I said, Ralph, I, I just, I, I think I need to get off the band. So it was our off night. And he and I went to hear the Kenton Band. Uh -huh. And I said, let's get bathed in brass, okay? <laughs> ten, ten brass players, okay? Five bones, five trumpets. Right. So we were sitting there, and it was at the trap, and, and Stan saw me, and I saw him, and I waved to him. And I'm looking, and I thought, I don't recognize the drummer. In fact, I don't remember who the drummer was at that particular time. Okay. But the drummer that was playing was not the original drummer. I thought Jimmy Campbell was on the, because Jimmy Campbell did uh, the Roadshow album with uh, June Christie. He right. recorded that. Right. And it wasn't, so an intermission, Stan comes down, he says, I'm auditioning drummers. He says, I want you to come up and play. Well, really? I said, what? I said, uh, no, Stan. He says, you're going to play. He says, no, I want you up to... And he walked away. Ralph said to me, Jerry, this is a golden opportunity This is an opportunity you. to do it. Okay. Well, to make a long, real long story short, I get up to the drums. Red Kelly was the bass player at that time. Red did a, quite a few albums with the band. And uh, he, he said, gee, Jerry, he says, it'd be great to hear you play. And I said, uh, when we uh, uh, let me know the, the lineup of tunes, well, Stan comes up on the bandstand, he starts calling tunes, and he says, Jerry, you don't need the music. He says, don't, don't play them. He says, just, just play. Is that just right? swing, yeah. He says, I said, Stan, there might be some breaks I need to know, whatever. So anyway, he goes down, so Red says, Jerry, pull up the tunes. Well, I knew a few of the tunes, not from by heart, but I'll really speed up the story. The last tune was a tune I did not, I did not record it with the band called The Big Chase. Oh, and yeah. at the end, I remember there's a huge drum solo. So we're, we're going along and I'm, I'm telling you, George, I was ringing wet ringing wet, got to the end, uh, end of the tune, and the band goes ba 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 da da and Stan cuts it off, and I take off on the solo. Till this day, George, <laughs> I have no clue what I played, what I did. B he brought the band back in, and that was it. Red said, Jerry, it was wonderful to play with you. I says, Red, you held it together with me, and I said, I, I can't do this again. I said, look <laughs> at me. I said, I had, I had no chops, as you call in the business, yeah, chops. Because yeah. I hadn't been doing anything, any fast tempo tunes on the McKinley Band. Right, I right. was, you know, I wasn't doing the, yeah. well, the specialty tunes. You're all in the mood in the, you know, I went, Pennsylvania 65,000. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. And I, after it was done, I went back, uh, Stan called me back in the uh, uh, back room, and he says, Jerry, he says, I want you to join the band in two weeks in Los Angeles. Wow. And that's how it happened. Lucky, ah, fortunate, fantastic. lucky break at the time. And I, I just, I said yes. And I went after that out of the room down to Ralph. He says, Jerry, he says, I n didn't think 
you could ever play like that. <laughs> Is that right? He's, yeah. He says, and you never had the opportunity. Exactly. You he know, says, you're sitting back there playing he, those Miller he said, charts. If, he says, you, he says, you deserve to get the, get the job with the, or the gig with the band, as we say. And I said, yes, he hired me. So in two weeks, I left the Miller band and joined Stan, uh, the band in L.A. But I can tell you in that two weeks, I was doing a lot of practicing in oh, the yeah. room to get my hands back in shape, to get my endurance back in shape. Yeah, that's a, that's a hot band. Well, you know, it, I, I, I got to tell you a story. Go ahead. I'm in high school, right? I'm a senior in high school, and the Stan Kenton Band is playing at a little tiny place called Lake Bomazine in Vermont. And so I said to a couple of my friends and a couple of young ladies, I said, why don't we go down and uh, listen to the band? So we went down. I had never heard a big band before. Never heard a big band before. And when that band came in, the Kenton drummer... Might have been you, I don't know. This was in the 50s, so probably before you. He had a huge cymbal with mallets, and it, he started that big swoosh sound, and all of a sudden the brass would come in. And the, the goosebumps never went down all night long. It was amazing. You said everything, and I would not have to repeat it right now. That's exactly what Stan loved on the band. He loved symbols. A lot of symbol. And, and it was I, mallets on yes, the symbols. Yes, exactly, George. I had three huge symbols on the band, and they all belonged to Stan. So when you hear the band, Stan had what's called a symbol library. He oh, used <laughs> all the symbols that he had. Is that right? And exactly what you were saying... I rolled with timpani mallets yeah. and with getting that ah before the band came in and Stan would always give me that like give me more cymbals. Yeah, give me, right, right. I thought I would <laughs> roll with timpani mallets on those cymbals. I thought they were gonna crack, George. Yeah. I'm serious. And to, to I got metal shaft timpani mallets and the hardest Beater album, or uh, uh, the, the 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 mallet, the mallet, the, the, itself, mallet right. the mallet sound. Okay, on the on those on those symbols that I could possibly get, unbelievable. But what a sound! Yeah, when we what used to sound. play the theme song, you know, artistry and rhythm. Oh yeah, I used to roll on the symbols for about three minutes till I kept going and going and going and going. <laughs> So finally he brought in the band, you yeah, know, so, yeah. oh yeah, he loved cymbals and uh, uh, I, I, it was it was unbelievable the, the power that I needed to drive the band. And also let me step back when you heard, when, when you went to hear the band, what a coincidence that you mentioned to me where you got Stan's autograph in Torrington, Connecticut. Lived in Torrington for about 10 years and... He used to come through town every once in a while and play at the local theater. And we'd go down, and I had a chance to buy one of his albums there and, and went to the bar after. Of course, Stan was there and half the band was there. And I got him to sign the album, which is great. I know, and you showed it to me. And I, when I played that venue in Torrington, Connecticut, it was a theater, right. and it was up on a, kind of up on a hill. And it, it wasn't a real large theater, no. but it was uh, acoustically. That's one, I, I, it just, it stuck out in my mind. And what a small world that you brought that up about Torrington. The acoustics in there were incredible. Yeah. The drum presence in there, the brass presence, the yeah, whole presence great. of the band. It was just fantastic, and I never forgot it. Yeah. Never forgot it. Torrington's get you talk <laughs> about a small, small world yeah, I know. that you, you mentioned when you mentioned Torrington, Connecticut to me. I, I it, it, it was unbelievable. But he always did his he always did his bit with the peanut vendor, and put the put the brass out in the audience. He, when a couple times I saw him, he would take the trumpets and place them strategically around the audience, and do the peanut vendor, and they would start that da da, and they would all start that clashing harmony. 
And he would do that. Exactly right. Or you, you, when he, he stationed them at various, like you said, various places in the audience, eventually, well, I shouldn't say eventually, the five trumpets were right together, right just in front of me. And they were all trying to screech as high as they possibly could oh, yeah. on the peanut fender. And you can still hear. Uh, yes. <laughs> Let me tell you, George, there, there are tunes with that band that I could, I, I can, they're so vivid in my mind. Yeah. I was so fortunate to play with that band on two occasions. I joined that band in late 58, in the 59, okay, in the 59, and I w then left the band, and I was a 10-year lag time okay. in 1972. Stan called me out of the clear blue. I get a phone call. I'm down in the basement playing on my drums. And the wife said, it's, there's a phone call for you. She says, I don't know who it is. I says, well, did, she says, I, I, I missed the name. So I grabbed the phone. I says, hello. He says, Jerry, this is Stan. I says, Stan? Stan who? Yeah. Well, he, says, <laughs> he says, Stan Kenton. And he come right at me. He said, do you want to come on back on the band? I was beyond, steps beyond, stunned. I said, yes. And I went back to, again, move it, the story along. That's when I was fortunate enough to record the Double Package album live at Butler University in Indiana called Live at Butler University with okay. the Four Freshmen. Oh, yeah. So I'm on that album. Plus, they had enough music, George, that they recorded a second double package album of just the band. Really? So wow. I did two double package albums there. Wow. Yeah. And so it was, it was, I was steps beyond fortunate to do that, seriously. And I mean, the, <clears throat> the two albums that I got a Grammy Awards for, the band got Grammy Awards for, that I was fortunate enough to record was Kenton's West Side Story. Oh, wow, that's, and, a, that's a great one. And the Adventures in Jazz album. So those two albums. Yeah. They, 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 to make a real long story short, the West Side Story album was a very, very difficult album. Oh, yeah. Johnny Richards was the composer, arranger for that. And again, Johnny came to me and he talked to the rhythm section, and it was interesting. He says, Jerry, I know how you play. He says, I don't want to take, you, to take anything personal by this. He says, what I have written in the, in the drum parts, he says, I want you to play those verbatim. Play really? them exactly the way I wrote them. He says, they'll work. Well, I, I had the utmost respect for Johnny Richards. Oh, he's terrific arranger. And they did. So when you hear me play on there, they're played exactly the way <laughs> that, right? that Johnny Richards wanted them played. Okay. Yeah, he was a heck of an arranger. Oh, yes. Wow. Oh, there was so much. I, I get excited about this. I mean, and again, I had so much respect for Lenny Niehaus. Oh, yeah. Lenny's things were so musical. And you obviously you know that he did all he does did all the music writing for Clint Eastwood. No, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, he does all. If you see the liner credits for music and that, and you'll, you'll catch Lenny Niehaus's name. But I did a fun album. It was called Adventures in Standard, which were all short tunes about maybe two minutes and thirty seconds or whatever. And Stan wanted to use those for filler tunes on the radio, and I. I knew the way Lenny wrote that what was coming when the when the brass was coming in, yeah, right. the fills and and the and the feeling that Lenny wanted with it, those were fun charts to play of his on the band. You know the, the the one album that I have, I think that he wrote most of the stuff was one called The Ballad Side of San Kenton. Yes. That was all mostly saxophones. Yes. A lot of saxophone stuff. Yes, yes. I did not record that album. No. no the but ballad. that was that was a great one. And he um, he does he has done a lot of arranging for saxophone quartets. Which is kinda interesting. Yes. You know? Yes. And we've we've played just recently we played uh, two of his arrangements uh, for a concert we did here locally. Oh. Yeah. How nice is that? Yeah. 
Well, the first, speaking of ballad albums, the very first ballad album that I recorded with Stan was called The Romantic Approach of Stan Kenton. Okay. Then he followed it up with another ballad type album called The Sophisticated Approach of Stan Kenton. Okay. And that was the second one. And then I had the fun album that was, that was really fun to record was from the creative world of Stan Kenton comes A Merry Christmas. Do you have that album? No, I don't. Yes. You led me into, you know, Stan augmented the band and put four mellophoniums. Right. right. I recorded with the mellophonium. Oh, did you? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm on that. Yeah, with the mellophonium. So 14 brass, wow. five bones, five trumpets, and four mellophoniums. So you can imagine yeah. the massive sound that is coming at me. And the interesting thing also, the way Stan set the band up, he didn't set it up in the Les Brown style stacked. Right. He set it up in a V shape. It's kind of like a V, right? Yes. The saxes were to my left. The trombones were to my right. Rhythm section sat directly in the middle. Drums, the conga player was to my left. Mm -hmm. The bass player was to my right. So the lead trumpet player was blowing right, right into over your head. the back, right over my <laughs> head. Well. I mean, the lead trumpet player's got all the, all the licks in it, as I call it. Right. So when Lenny, when I told Lenny, I, I had briefly mentioned Lenny, I said, Lenny, don't write the drum chart. I says, just Xerox the lead trumpet player's part. <laughs> yeah. I know what's coming, but yeah. he he just gave me a little roadmap to do. Yeah. But I knew, I knew the way. I, I'm getting excited about it. I knew the way Lenny wrote. I really did. I mean, we had. A slew of arrangers coming in. We had Lenny Niehaus, you had Johnny Richards, you had Marty Page, that oh, yeah. thing. You had Ken Hanna that, that sent some things in. You had uh, uh, Bill Holman oh, yeah. and Pete Rugolo. And one of the one of the favorite albums of mine, and my very dear drummer is on it, Mel Lewis is on it. Oh, yeah. And Mel and I became very close friends through the years. And he played on that particular album. That is one of the most fantastic albums ever recorded by that band. And Mel's playing was incredible. I mean, he was just a very musical drummer. And what I'm leading you into on that particular album, there was one of them. I picked out this chart, Stomping at the Savoy, oh, yeah. if you hear it. And I listened to it, and I listened to the way Mel played it. And I tried, I tried <laughs> to get Stan to play that chart. And you know the interesting thing? He did not like nostalgia. He liked to keep surging forward. Yeah. He yeah. Just kept pushing forward, pushing forward. Well, he pushed forward too much for me at, towards the end. He was getting into Cuban fire and some of these other things were, were really kind of getting really far out. Well, no. I take it that maybe you're not wasn't a real fan of Cuban Fire, were mm. you? You can be honest with me. Oh, now this was one of the albums that Mel is on drums. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yes, that he again, he played absolutely fantastic. Oh, and yeah. The way they recorded him, and I tried. There was we played one of the charts on there, and I loved it. It was in six eight. It's it's the, uh, the the name of it is La Suerte de los Tontos, okay. and that stands for the Fortune of the Fools, and I laid into that yeah. one, man. Let me tell you, that was <laughs> one. In fact, I got goosebumps talking about it. I laid into that one. I mean, I was on, I was on a destroy mission on my drum set. <laughs> yeah. When I used, when we did the clinics, yeah. With with the uh, at the schools and that, I had. So much fun with those clinics, conveying what I was doing with the band, mm -hmm. and and things just basics to give them to go away with something from what I was doing. Okay, mm -hmm. just the simple basics, and my drum teacher, my second teacher, taught me two very important things, George, that I've carried through my career my musical journey, 
is Jerry, he says, I'm going to teach you time, being able to swing, read music. He said, the drum solos are just I, extra credits on your report card. Yeah. He said, don't worry about the drum solos. He said, time. Yep. And that's a, my signature yeah. approach is time because he said also, he says, as you go along and you get into the recording studios, you're going to have to play with a click track. Oh, geez, yeah. And you, some guys hate that. Yeah, I know it. Some guys hate that. You got to play with a click track, I know. okay? So <laughs> that was, that was, I was so fortunate to have two teachers. And the second one uh, took me at age 11 and then pushed me forward. And then finally he said, you got to come out of the basement, he says, and you got to go out and do it. Yep. He says, and it could be very painful sometimes. He said, you're going to slip and fall or you're going to fall or whatever. <laughs> yeah. and, and another thing, too, he said, well, some of the people are not going to like your playing. So he says, just prepare yourself for that. Yeah. But I never forgot this either. He said, Jerry, be yourself. And I've never forgot that. Yeah. So when you hear me play, my emotion behind the drums what I'm doing is coming from from my heart, going to the people, yep. and I'm conveying that emotion to them when I play the drums. And I love playing. I love playing ballads. I like I like playing ballads. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I really enjoy playing ballads. Wow, what a story! <laughs> well, I from from start to up to where. But you've been doing a lot locally. Yes, let me, locally, I've been very, very fortunate. I led my own group. You had your own group at Nicola's there yes, for years. It was, yes, it was Jerry McKenzie's Just Jazz. I was fortunate enough to bring in various people from from singers to trombone to trumpet to sax to vibes, et cetera. I did a rotation in there, yeah. and it was, we were there for about 15 years, I think, 16 years. That's fantastic. And I, it was just fortunate, but there's so much talent around the Detroit area. I love Detroit. Yeah, I mean, there's you know. all kinds of talent, and I was, I was so The Michigan Jazz Festival yes. is the best, in my well, opinion. I'll be yeah. there, but yeah. not playing. Oh, dear. Okay, no, not playing. In fact, I, I finally have decided that it was time, George. It was time to just, I, I very simply said, and leave it there with my with my drum playing is to go out on a high Absolutely. and leave it there and just yeah. just do that you know I, I did just uh, just go out on a high yes I miss it and I will miss my colleagues that I've, I've played music with and all that but I can do I can do anything I can do anything I could be an MC I could do anything they want me to do uh, yeah. as far as uh, you know music is concerned sure. I'll be at the Michigan Jazz Festival and also a very, very dear friend of mine, George, his name is Larry Gage, he made a donation to the Michigan Jazz Festival mm -hmm. and named a stage after me. It's, Fantastic. It's Jerry McKenzie's Rathskeller stage. That's great. So that'll be it. So, I mean, I just want to say, so I'll be there and I'll get to see the people that I've seen throughout the years the people that I know and, and just have, I'm really looking forward to it. Jerry, what a pleasure this has been. We gotta wrap it up. Can you believe we've gone through 30 minutes already? Really? <laughs> yeah. George, this has been steps beyond this has been This has been great. Yes. And uh, thank you so much for coming. It's been a great, great pleasure of this, mine. This has and, been uh, my pleasure for you. Uh, and I, I mean that and uh, it, it's it's I, hopefully I've conveyed some things to you the have. people it's been fantastic. and uh, given them some of the insights as far as music uh, along with you too and <laughs> you're still doing all the music still and trying I, to do it Jerry thank you ever so much for uh, from my heart okay. to well, your heart George thank you thank you for watching ladies and gentlemen.